Good morning, everybody. It's Athenaeum Spotlight with Guy McLean. I'm Mark Auerbach, and you're listening or watching us on either Westfield Community Programming Channel 15 or Southwick Community Programming Channel 15 or 89.5 FM WSKB. We got a good program today because Guy has made a series of videos um, that profile some of the best art in the archives, is it called the archives of? Well, yeah, we have an archives, but we also have an, have an artifact collection at the it, Athenaeum. So yeah. this is archival art and artifacts. Yeah, yeah, it's part of our uh, history museum. The, the archives and the artifact collection make up our history museum, but also too, because we have a lot of paintings, a lot of other artwork, drawings, uh, watercolors in the collection. We have a we have quite an extensive art collection uh, that uh, is part that we use for both uh, sometimes history exhibits, but also in this case, uh, kind of an extensive art exhibit. So you made a whole bunch of videos, and I, actually, you you took me for a personal tour of the Athenaeum a couple of weeks ago, and these videos play near the piece of art that they're describing. It's kind of like, this is, it, it, I, I, I can't remember her name, the, the, the art nun the, on public television that would describe. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, but you weren't in the habit, you were in a suit, and you were <laughs> explaining the various pieces of art. And it was fascinating to learn about some of the, the artwork there. And I had no idea that the Athenaeum in Westfield is what it is. So I, I can now say firsthand that um, it's well worth a visit. I mean, it, whether you want to check out books or whether you want to look at art or any of the other uh, things that you have there. So what a great, well, what a great opportunity! It's just such a fabulous place. Well, we feel like uh, you know the Athenaeum uh, uh, that. You know, mo most of the community around Westfield and in, in neighboring towns know the Athenaeum for its library, and I think I'm very proud of our library. We have a very, uh, you know, active operation there and a uh, very active uh, patron base who comes in and uses the library quite extensively. But what's less known is the Athenaeum actually consists of the library as well as two museums, a history museum and an art museum. Uh, and we have extensive collections. And, and uh, one of the things that we're doing now is we're trying to really uh, upgrade those parts of the, what the Athenaeum offers and uh, bring that more to the center of attention. And so f this exhibit uh, is a chance to show off some of our best art. And I, you know, I'm really happy with how it turned out because we have some very interesting paintings, very interesting stories that are, both are interesting from an art perspective and are interesting from a history perspective that really tell the story of people who've lived in Westfield in the past and uh, also document uh, some of the interesting artists that have been active. And then you mentioned the little uh, video uh, that we're doing that we'll, we're, we're going to show uh, here in just a few minutes. Uh, we, we also feel like uh, we're, we're on the cutting edge of technology. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with this art exhibit was to add an uh, audiovisual component uh, for you know, almost like um, uh, an electronic label, uh, rather than having to read the label on the wall, which we have, we have the labels there that you can read and learn about the paintings and learn about the, 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 the people in the art. We also have this, these videos that we show in the exhibit area that people can watch to get a little extra uh, information on some of the artworks. How many videos did you ultimately make? Uh, we, we ultimately we made nine of them for this exhibit. We have more paintings than that in the exhibit, but we felt that we chose nine works of art that we felt were uh, both it, that had both interesting history stories and art stories, and were also representative of the collection. And so uh, it, it really came together very nicely. They're little short bites of, of you know two, three, four minutes of information on a particular painting or a particular artist. Uh, and I think it really adds a nice component uh, to the uh, to the art exhibit. So we're going to show the, uh, some of them during the course of today's program. If you are watching us on Westfield TV, or you decide to watch us on YouTube after the fact, uh, it, the program is archived at WSKB Community Radio. You'll actually get to see the videos. Otherwise, if you're listening on 89.5 FM WSKB, you get an audio version. So if you're listening on the radio and you go, wow, I want to catch these, you either can 
go over to the Athenaeum where they show in rotation. That's right. Or you uh, go to YouTube, WSKB Community Radio, and you'll find them there. You could watch them, and you watch this entire program, plus all the other um, Athenaeum spotlights that we've done. How long did it take you to, to do all the videos? Oh, we worked on these for several weeks uh, because there's a lot of preparation in terms of the research and this sort of thing, uh, but also just getting it set up to show the paintings along with my commentary uh, along with it. So it was, a, and, and we have a, gr you know, the Athenaeum, we have a great staff of people who are really up on technology. One of our uh, librarians there, uh, Gretchen Holmeyer, is really very good at putting together v videos uh, and this sort of thing. And so she was very helpful in helping us to put this together. Yeah, we got a shout out to Gretchen because she provided all the videos so that we could use them today and that Peter Coles could um, show them. Um, she was terrific to work with. Yeah, she's really, really knowledgeable, uh, and she's also very knowledgeable about social media and this sort of thing. So she has become our social media uh, librarian as, long, as, as well as doing videos for us and other technological things. I mean, we live in a time where I think uh, we can really uh, enhance uh, the presentation of history and art uh, through video presentations, and that's exactly what we're doing right here with this with this particular exhibit. So um, Christmas is in a couple of days, right? Um, is, is the uh, Athenaeum open uh, between Christmas and New Year's? Uh, we sure are. We are going to be closed on uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, uh, but then we're open uh, because Christmas is on Saturday. Uh, we're, we're normally closed on Sunday, but then the next week, Monday through Friday, we'll be open. Uh, of course, we'll be closed uh, on New Year's Day, but Monday through Friday, we're open uh, the week after Christmas. And that's a good time to come by and see this exhibit. Uh, it should be a time when uh, not too many people are around because people are doing vacation things, so it's a good time to visit. And uh, if, if, if you could ask Santa for one thing for the Athenaeum besides a, a check or a contribution, what are some of the things that you're looking for money for for uh, 2022? Well, one of the, well, uh, oh, we have several programs that we're uh, uh, trying to implement right now. One of the things that we're really excited about, and we hope to find some sponsors for this, uh, because I think uh, this is going to be an exciting new, uh, new presentation that we have at the Athenaeum, is our history exhibits. We're in the process of completely renovating the Reed Room, uh, one of the rooms on the main floor of the library, uh, and we're going to have two large exhibit cases and we're going to feature many of the really wonderful artifacts from the history collection and tell the story of Westville. I mean Westville has a lot of interesting aspects uh, that I think probably many Westville residents are not aware of. Uh, there's some interesting stories. Uh, the during the Industrial Revolution, Westfield uh, was a very active uh, uh, manufacturer of whips, which of course a lot of people know because we call it ourselves the Whip City. Uh, but there's other things like uh, church organs. Who knew that Westfield was one of the major manufacturing centers of church organs in the 19th century, but William Johnson, uh, 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 developed, was a kind of an entrepreneur back in the 1840s uh, and uh, started working on developing new church organs and developed a very high quality product and there are Johnson organs throughout the United States still to this, still to this day that were produced in Westfield. So there are stories like that. Uh, you can go, you know, I can just go on with a list of things like that. Um, and so we want to feature that in our history exhibits. So one of the things that we're trying to do right now is to open up this completely new space for history displays. And we hope to find some sponsors so that we can, we can continue to uh, bring about new exhibits. We hope to be able to bring out a, a, a kind of a new specialized exhibit, rotating uh, exhibits about once every four to six months. Uh, but, but it costs money to put these exhibits together. Many times, uh, before we can uh, show an object, uh, we have to perform conservation work on. You know, some of these objects go back 100, 150 years, 200 years uh, of age, and uh, they need conservation work before we can put them on display. And that costs quite a bit of money. Conservation is really expensive. And so things like that, we need support for. So I would say my, on my Christmas list is hoping that people will come forward and, and support uh, this new history project. And uh, what uh, for for yourself personally? Um, what 
recording or tickets to what show or performance is on your list? Oh, yeah. I, I, I can't wait to get into New York again uh, to go to the operas there. I mean, there are several operas in New York, in New York uh, that are coming up this year that I think are going to be really uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, I just was out in San Francisco and saw Costi Ventuti, Mozart's great opera, uh, that he wrote uh, one of the three uh, operas that he did with Lorenzo de Ponte uh, uh, as the librettist. Uh, and it was a great show. Uh, it was quite interesting. Here's an 18th century opera, but the San Francisco Opera decided to uh, uh, place it, place the story in, 19, in 1930s America, in rural, in rural America in a, at a country club. And it was it was a great production. I I, I thought that it was such, such an original idea. It's such a great way of presenting um, uh, Mozart's opera and really bringing it up to the current day, making it more relevant for the current day. Yeah. So okay. So metro uh, opera tickets are on. Uh, Absolutely. On that's my a list. stocking stuffer, right? That's so a stocking you're, stuffer. When you okay. Yeah. Any recordings or films that you want? Uh, uh, well, uh, um, uh, recordings, you know, th there's uh, um, uh, some interesting recordings coming out by uh, a composer that probably a lot, a lot of people uh, are not familiar with, but I think uh, she's really amazing. Her name is Missy Mazzoli, uh, and she combines, uh, she's a contemporary uh, a composer coming out of a classical music tradition, uh, but she brings in jazz and indie rock elements and other elements into her music. And she really represents, I, I think, a new trend in uh, contemporary classical music uh, where it's, it's not just classical music, it's a combination of classical music with, with uh, rock, with jazz, with other, uh, you know, some, some other traditions as well. And Missy Bazzoli is a good example of this. And I, I become very interested in her music. So that's, that's one of my list on, you know, to uh, uh, acquire a couple of recordings okay. of Missy so Bazzoli. All right, and so what I'd like is I'd like every single original cast album that Stephen Sondheim wrote. I want them all. Yes, yes. It's in. I was I was so upset to to see that uh, that Sondheim just died just that last it, week. I was very upset about it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, he was my favorite Broadway composer, probably the only composer that I've ever shed a tear hearing about his passing yeah um yeah i mean i i can't even begin to and then somebody somebody said well, what was your favorite sondheim song i can't pick one right. there are so many yeah but what i found was really interesting was in terms of my social media feed i was tired of seeing black friday sales all the social garbage that's on social media um giving Tuesday requests for money and everything. And people over the course of the weekend, at least in my social media world, were posting YouTube um, performances of Sondheim work and, and stuff like that. So over the course of Thanksgiving weekend, I had a chance to kind of kick back and see some of the Sondheim that I'd forgotten about and was reminded of and I think uh, we've lost a great composer who lived a great long life but the gifts that he gave us musically will never be forgotten and the idea that um, there's always a Sondheim musical playing somewhere around and Barrington Stage is opening its 2022 season with a little night music great I mean what more could one ask for right yeah and I think you know I think uh, one thing about Sondheim that's so important is I, th I think he almost single-handedly saved Broadway. Uh, he, um, in you know, in the 50s and 60s, it was kind of the golden age of Broadway uh, musicals. And then, you know, rock music kind of came in and, it, you know, it was, it was kind of a very uncertain future for the Broadway musical. Uh, uh, at that time, but Sondheim came up with a, a, because his music was so um, uh, strong, uh, so so lyrical, but yet so strong, and also his themes uh, were very serious. He brought a seriousness to the Broadway stage that I think uh, was 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 very was very much needed at that time. And it's funny. I mean, um, right now there are two Sondheim musicals on Broadway. One is Company, yeah. that's been revamped with his approval, and it stars Patti Lupone. Uh, but the lead character, instead of being a 35-year-old bachelor and his married friends, is now a, 
a bachelorette and her married friends. Yes. And there's a revival of Assassins, which is a very dark show. And uh, there's always a Sondheim show playing somewhere. Yes, yes. And and also, too, you know, I've, I was talking about operas earlier. Many of the opera houses are starting to perform Sondheim because of the quality of the productions that he put together. Uh, both in terms of uh, the stories, the themes he took on, and the music. Uh, just it, it's, it, it's incredible. Yeah. Sweeney Todd in particular plays the opera houses yes. a lot. I mean, I've seen the New York City Opera production of it. I've seen the Houston Grand Opera production of it. And that's one that you frequently see. And a little night music and a little as well. Night. Yes, yes, you know, yes. Which are both require a lot of vocal technique. Right. We're going to take a little, let's take a fast break here and acknowledge the underwriters that make Athenaeum Spotlight possible. And we'll come back and tell us about the first video. And okay. And we'll start watching some movies and look at art. Great. I mean, we never get to do that, right? Yeah, right. So we're, we're here at Athenaeum Spotlight on Westfield Community Programming Channel 15, 89.5 5 FM WSKB and now Southwick Community Programming as well. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. Guy McLean, Mark Auerbach will return after these messages. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Barnes and Noble College Bookstore in the Ely Campus Center, offering Westfield State t shirts, sweatshirts, and gift merchandise, all of your academic needs, and offering textbook materials in new, used, ebook and rental formats available at the bookstore on campus or online at westfieldstate.bncollege.com support for community radio on wskb is provided by betts plumbing and heating supply company an independent family-owned wholesaler serving westfield for over 50 years specializing in plumbing heating and industrial piping supplies on the web at BetsPlumbing.com or at 14 Coleman Avenue in Westfield. Join me, Tina Gorman, each week from 6 to 8 a.m. for Wake Up Wednesday, when my guests and I discuss health, wellness, and lifestyle reimagined. Community Radio. 89.5 WSKB. Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to Athenaeum Spotlight. Guy McLean, Mark Auerbach, Peter Coles is our chief engineer. So, Guy, we're going to look at a movie. Yes, yes. I thought the one I wanted to start with was um, uh, a little video that we did on two of the paintings in the exhibit that I think are just extraordinary. They're some of the earliest works we have in, in the museum. They date to the 1840s. Uh, and there are t uh, two young women, uh, probably teenagers at the time the paintings were created, uh, 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 from the Thayer family. The Thayer family uh, was one of the wealthiest families in Westfield in the early 19th century. Uh, their, their parents, uh, her, uh, their father is, uh, uh, was, a, was one of the business leaders in the community at that time. Uh, the whip industry that became so important for Westfield, he was one of the kind of the founding people that kind of helped that industry get off the gr get off the ground and he was involved in several other businesses as well um, and he uh, at that time uh, this was of course prior to photography so at that time uh, if 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 you were from a fairly wealthy family uh, when an artist came to town usually artists would travel around at that time to diff different towns looking for business when an artist came to town uh, the family would commission the artist to paint portraits of the of the children and many times of themselves, and there are, in 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 the exhibit we also have two paintings uh, uh, of the parents as well. But the artist uh, is Joseph Whiting Stock, an artist from Springfield who was uh, was crippled from an accident at the age of eleven. Uh, and he took up art uh, as as a as a profession that he could do from a wheelchair. And so I think it's a very interesting uh, video. I talk about all these things. And so I think you know, without without further ado, we could go ahead and show this video uh, about the Thayer Sisters of Westfield and by the artist Joseph Whiting Stock. Okay. Uh, these two paintings are two of the most prized paintings we have in the collection of the Westfield Athenaeum. Uh, these are the Thayer Sisters. Uh, painted by Joseph Whiting Stock. Let me talk about Joseph Whiting Stock first because the artist 
uh, there's a very interesting story about him. Uh, Joseph Whiting Stock, uh, at the age of 11, had a, a, a really bad accident. An ox cart fell on him, and he was paralyzed from the waist down. And after that, he was very, you can quite imagine a young boy uh, losing the use of his legs. He was very depressed. And so the doctor who was helping him uh, looked for ways of things that he could do uh, uh, from a wheelchair. And so the doctor suggested that he try art. And the boy did and uh, found that he had quite a talent for painting. And so he became uh, a portrait painter uh, in the early years of the 19th century. He started kind of in the 1830s. His, his peak time to work was the 1840s and the early 1850s. These two paintings were done in 1847. And Joseph Weidenstock fits the pattern of many artists uh, at this time. Uh, they were usually, uh, we, re we refer to them today as itinerant artists. They traveled around to different locations, different cities, different towns. Uh, they would look for people who could afford uh, portraits like these. These were pretty expensive, so not everyone could afford paintings like this. So he would go into a community, look for people who wanted to have their portraits done. He would uh, paint uh, the people in town that were willing to do that, and then he would move on to a different spot. But he did maintain a studio in Springfield, his hometown. Uh, he lived there. When he wasn't on the road, he would live in Springfield and work from the studio there. In spite of the fact that he was in a, in a wheelchair, he executed over 800 paintings in his lifetime, which just seems incredible to me. He had a lot of health problems, and he died at the age of 40 from tuberculosis. Uh, so it's kind of, he had a sad, very difficult life, but he, he produced some really great work. Now, another thing about the itinerant artist in New England, uh, New England did not have uh, uh, art academies or places where you could get academic training. So most of these itinerant artists who worked in, in New England in the early uh, part of the 19th century were self-trained or they would work with uh, you know, an, another itinerant artist. So, so many, so their style has kind of a folk or primitive style to it. But in spite of the fact that they didn't have academic training, these artists, many times, the the best ones were very original, and many times they they came up with things that academic artists didn't come up with. Uh, using colors in certain ways, using uh, certain kinds of backgrounds in, uh, in certain ways. Uh, and Joseph Weidenstock is a great example of this. Uh, uh, people who collect New England folk art today uh, really think Joseph Weidenstock paintings are some of the best folk art of the early 19th century. Now, let's talk about the Thayer sisters. Uh, the Thayer sisters were members of one of the most uh, prominent families in Westfield in the day. Their parents had a house it was a 30-room mansion, 15 bedrooms. Now, this is in the early part of the 19th century, a 30-room mansion uh, that they lived in, and it's where Big Y is today. So if you wanted to know where it was in Westfield, it's where Big Y is on Broad Street and East Silver. In, in the 1840s, Joseph Weidenstock came to, uh, came to town, and of course the Thayer sisters, uh, the Thayer family, being one of the wealthiest families in town, could afford uh, to have these wonderful paintings uh, uh, executed. Another thing about the location, at that time, that location where the Thayer Mansion was located was called 100 Acres, and it was right along the Little River, and you can actually see the Little River uh, back in the background, so you can actually see that property uh, 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 incorporated into the painting. Another th uh, aspect that's very important, you can see that both sisters are holding books. Um, that's not, that wasn't just a prop, just to have something to hold uh, for the city. Um, the use of books or other kinds of things that sometimes people held uh, were, sim uh, were symbolic. Patrons who, you, who held books, that was a symbol that they were literate. Not everyone was literate at that time, so this was an indication that both of these sisters were able to read. Um, the, these, uh, we also have portraits of the two parents, and we, but we don't know who the artists were who did the parents, but we know that Joseph Wedding Stock did these. Many of the itinerant artists work, worked almost anonymously at that time. They tended to not sign their work, and so many paintings in this time period uh, we don't know who the artists are, but we do know that these were done by Joseph Waddingstock.
So we're very, so we're very proud to have these paintings, and these paintings are are featured. Uh, in our show, Untold Stories, uh, which features uh, some of the best paintings, some of the treasures of the Westville Athenaeum collection. If you want more information on uh, the Thayer Mansion, uh, Bob Brown, in his History Talks, uh, has a whole segment about the Thayer Mansion. That's fascinating. Isn't, isn't that an interesting yeah. story? Yeah, Here. That's, fa that's fascinating, holding a book because to prove that they were literate. Yes, that's one of the th things that's interesting. You know, uh, paintings like that give such an interesting story and give you an, such an interesting picture of how people lived at that time, what was important to them. Literacy was something very, very new uh, for, m for many people at that time, and especially for women. Women weren't given the education that men were at that time, so the fact that these two girls were holding books uh, sent sent a very clear message to the, the the original people who would who would have seen these paintings in the Thayer Mansion. Uh, so I think that's so that gives you a, just that one uh, just knowing that one thing that you see in those paintings tells you so much about what was important in their lives and how they lived and what was going on uh, at, at in that time. Also, too, the very fact that it shows a little a little piece of of Westfield in the background with the little with the, with the little river there, I think it's such an interesting uh, kind of special feature yeah. there. Yeah, the the house where the where they were um, painted is it still around? No, no, no. It, it, now it's been torn down, uh, and uh, that's where the Big Y grocery store is. Uh, you know, it's uh, I, I guess it's called uh, progress in the tw in the twentieth and twenty first yeah. century. So let's look at another one. Um, which one do you want to show now? Well, I think the the next one that might be interesting is the painting by uh, Irene Parmalee, uh, an artist from Springfield, uh, of Lucy Fowler Gillette. Uh, the Fowler and Gillette families were very, very prominent in Westfield in the 19th century. Um, uh, and uh, Lucy uh, was especially, uh, especially in, uh, interesting figure, she had several children. One of her children uh, became a U.S. congressman and Speaker of the House uh, between 1919, right after World War I, 1919 and 1925. Uh, and, that, you know, and a lot of people don't realize that Westfield uh, produced uh, 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 someone as, as, as important as the Speaker of the House. Uh, I think that's very uh, important to know. I mean, West, little Westfield, Produced a governor of Massachusetts and a, a speaker of the house, and this particular painting uh, is a painting of his mother uh, by an artist, Irene Parmalee, who I think is uh, she was she, she she studied in Paris uh, for three years in the 1880s. Very uh, interesting artist, and uh, and she lived she lived in Springfield. She lived in Springfield. She grew up in Connecticut. Uh, but in the 1870s, she decided to set up a studio in Springfield. Wow. Springfield, of course, it was a very important industrial city at that time, growing rapidly. And so it, it was a logical place for an artist like Irene Parmalee. Yeah. Another aspect about this, too, is not too many women artists in the 19th century. That's for and sure. She was very, very successful in, uh, in painting and, in, you know, in, uh, influenced by Impressionism. Because when she was studying in Paris, Impressionism was all the rage at that time. Uh, so her art is very interesting, very original, and I think, you know, yeah, that might be a very interesting video to watch. So yeah. let's, Peter, let's, can we roll that yeah, one? Yeah, let's go to that one. This is a painting of Lucy Douglas Fowler Gillette, uh, who was part of one of the most prominent families in Westfield in the early 19th, uh, throughout the, really throughout the 19th century. She had three children. She was the mother of Frederick uh, Fowler, who was a prominent United States congressman and became Speaker of the House in 1919, right after World War I. And he remained in that role until 1925. Uh, so she was uh, the mother of uh, one of the most prominent uh, politicians to ever live in Westfield. This particular portrait was done by Irene Parmalee, a very interesting artist uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, she studied at Yale. Uh, and studied with several people in the Hartford area. And then she, in 1875, she set up a studio in Springfield and maintained that studio except for a one period of time until 1929.
that period of time when she did not have the studio in Springfield was between 1881 and 1884. She, like many art, many American artists of that time, felt that uh, you couldn't really get the depth of education to become a great artist uh, in the United States. Uh, art academies, uh, other other institutions for uh, learning about art, studying art, were just not uh, that available in the United States. And so in 1881, she traveled to Paris, studied with several very important artists there in the Studio Julien, uh, and stayed there for three years. This is not unusual. Uh, John Singer Sargent, Homer, Winslow Homer, uh, several other artists uh, did the same thing. They spent a lot of time uh, in Europe studying art. In fact, people like James McNeil Whistler, uh, after the age of 21, left the United States. He had spent some time in, in, in Europe uh, as a child, came back to the United States, went to West Point, was thrown out of West Point by Colonel, the, then Colonel Robert E. Lee, uh, and then decided that since he wasn't successful as a military officer, he would go to Europe and become an artist. And so he left the United States at the age of 21, never returned to the United States, lived in Europe for the rest of his life. And this is something we see in many, many artists. And Irene Parmley, the person who did this painting, uh, is another example of an artist who spent several years uh, in Europe studying art. And you can see the influence of European art at this time. She was there in the 1880s, which was the height of French Impressionism. Artists like Monet, Degas, Mary Cassatt, another American artist who spent most of her life in Europe, uh, were developing uh, Impressionism at this time. And you can see this especially in her, w with her dress. You can see the very loose brush strokes uh, that she employed there. Also, the very casual pose is something that was not very characteristic of portrait uh, art in the 19th century, but here you see a, a, a more casual kind of pose with a very loose type of brush stroke, very characteristic of Impressionism that she must have seen many examples of while she was living in Paris in the 1880s. So this is a painting that we, very, that we value a lot here at the Athenaeum. Uh, it's a painting uh, that is one of our most uh, cherished paintings and also one of our earliest paintings. So we're very happy to include this uh, in our exhibit of the treasures of the Athenaeum. Another great uh, short video. Isn't that an interesting story, yeah. though? You know, and and uh, one of the things that, uh, as as I did the research in putting together this show, and I went through literally dozens of paintings, picking out the the best examples from our collection. Uh, you, know, I, we're, you know, this exhibit is showing maybe maybe a fifth. Uh, of our of our uh, of our collection of art, and uh, it's just so interesting to discover this. And one of the things that uh, I discovered as I was doing the research, I was going through and looking at all the paintings in the Athenaeum collection, is that there were a lot of really excellent professional artists uh, uh, working in in Westfield over the years, and professional women artists. Um, uh, it, it's it's quite remarkable uh, when when we, we when we think about this. Uh, that so that that Westfield and 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 remember Westfield was much Westfield now what about forty thousand people uh, in the nineteenth century it was a much smaller uh, city uh, but yet uh, there were professional artists uh, working in Westfield going back uh, to the er, to the the middle. 19th century, which I think is quite remarkable. And one of the ones that I think is, is really uh, very interesting, maybe we'll do a video um, uh, of her uh, net, uh, next. Um, she, she, it, it, uh, earlier we were talking about Johnson Organs. Yeah. Well, her, well his wife uh, was also an artist, and she was very successful as an artist in, in Westville at that time. She was doing portraits, a lot of portraits, but she did, also did landscapes. Many of our uh, best scenes of Westville, uh, you know, to, to, to get a sense of what Westville looked like, uh, many times we go to her paintings uh, to, to take a look at them because she painted streets and, uh, and you know, townscapes and 
streets in Westfield and this sort of thing. And so I think that might be the, a really good one to yeah, show let's, next. Let's roll that one next. Yeah, let's because I think that would be a really good one to We're see. We're very happy uh, to include this painting in our exhibit on the treasures of the Westfield Athenaeum. This is a painting by Marianne Douglas Johnson, uh, an artist who uh, lived in West, grew up in Westfield, lived here her entire life. Uh, th this particular painting was painted about 1850, so it's a very early painting, one of the earliest in our collection. And uh, Marianne uh, was uh, a professional artist. She actually was making a very sizable income. In fact, it, there are reports that her yearly income was two to three times that of a regular worker. Uh, and she made that from her work as an artist. So, so she was a very successful artist in that day. And I think it's an important thing to point out that uh, this, with limited options for women in the 19th century, painting, being an artist, was one of them where a, a woman could have a successful career. And, Mar and Marianne uh, uh, is, is certainly an example of an artist who did that. This particular painting is very interesting for another reason for people interested in Westfield history. She went out in 1850 and painted a painting uh, of the Farmington Canal. This was a canal built uh, in the 1820s that ran from Northampton through Westfield down through Farmington, Connecticut, and that's why they call it the Farmington Canal, and on to New Haven. The idea was if this was pre-railroad, pre-major highways, and so it was very, uh, canals were the thing that everybody was building in the 1820s in America in order to uh, help trade and commerce progress. And so this canal was very important for the economy of Westfield, and it actually went uh, just behind, uh, just on the south side of Elm Street. In fact, where I'm standing in the Westfield Athenaeum, we're literally just a couple of blocks away from where uh, the canal ran through the center of Westfield. And all the factories at that time uh, would line up along the canal because that was a good way of getting your goods down, uh, down, you know, going down to New Haven and then on, you could put it on ocean-going vessels and send your goods to wherever uh, you were uh, 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 trading them. So this, so she was painting this canal, but she was painting this canal after it had gone out of business. Uh, the canal had a really short life. It was finished, the Westfield component was finished about 1829 and it was used quite extensively uh, through the 1830s. But in 1840, a brand new transportation technology hit the scene in Westfield. In 1840, the railroad arrived. And the railroad was so much more efficient and, and so much uh, faster uh, that the canal uh, became basically uh, not as proficient a way of getting goods to market. And so it went out of business uh, in, the er in the early to mid-1840s. So at the time she paints this painting, this the canal was already in, in decline, uh, which adds a certain kind of um, uh, nostalgic aspect to this painting. And you can see it, and uh, you can see that she's taking that approach. It's more of a nature scene in many ways than it's a scene about the canal. Uh, she's almost looking at the canal as a, a ruin, an older ruin, even though it had been it, it had only recently closed. And even the, the figure down here in the corner, this man sitting, uh, kind of sitting on a log here with his dog to the side, indicates that um, this, this canal is kind of going back to nature, you might say. But this is very interesting. This documents the importance of the canal uh, at that time uh, during this brief period, but very important period in the history of Westfield. Because in the 1820s and 1830s, this was a time when the Industrial Revolution was really starting to have a major impact on uh, really the entire country, uh, but especially in New England. Towns like Springfield, Holyoke, Westfield, uh, Chicopee were all uh, building, starting to build factories and take advantage of the manufacturing uh, that was being developed during the Industrial Revolution. And so this is a record of this very important uh, aspect of Westfield business uh, in, in the mid-19th century. This is, all, as I said earlier, this is also one of our oldest paintings in the collection, and so we're very, very uh, happy to include this in our exhibit.
This is another painting uh, by uh, Marianne Douglas Johnson. This is a court street, the street that's right by the Westfield Athenaeum. This shows uh, just the quality of, of her work. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, at this time, most artists made their, you know, she was, she, this was her profession. And so uh, most of the ways that artists at this time made money was through portraiture, uh, doing portraits of uh, prominent people in the community. But she did a lot of landscape scenes. Uh, and this is another one, in addition to the one we just saw of the canal. This is one that she did of Court, of Court Street. And it's a wonderful record of what Court Street looked like uh, in the mid-19th century. And you can see uh, it follows the exact same road as Court, as Court Street today. Uh, and there, there are trees in, you know, in that center area there between uh, the two lanes. Uh, there, is, there are trees, but there aren't half as many trees today. There must have been a lot. You can see how many trees are shown here. So there must have been a lot more trees at that time. Also, if you notice the house, just over here to the right of the painting, this is the house that later became uh, the Westfield Athenaeum. Now, it's the boys and girls section of the, of the, of the library. The, the rest of the, of the building has been built off uh, to the, the right and be outside this painting. But this is a record of what this house looked like. Uh, in the mid-19th century. And she, and she uh, really captures a sense of how Westfield, even though Westfield, by the time she was active here uh, in the 19th century, Westfield was becoming a, a more of an urban location with industry here, factories. The whip industry uh, had already become a major uh, industry in Westfield along with other industries. Uh, but yet, it still has a feeling of small town, almost like a rural town. Another interesting thing about Marianne Douglas Johnson is um, she, uh, her maiden name was Douglas. She married William Johnson, who was very prominent in Westfield as well. He um, uh, uh, got interested in making church organs and became very proficient at building church organs. And his factory, his business of church organs, pretty soon were being installed in churches all across the United States. And even though Johnson's Organ Works company is long gone, it went, basically went out of business in the 1920s, went through several uh, changes in, la in, the la in the later years, but basically was out of business by the 1920s. But yet to this day, in the organ world, people who are interested in church organs know the Johnson name. This is a very important name in the organ world. Uh, today and Marianne Douglas Johnson was uh, William Johnson's wife, but she had her own profession. This is a, you know she she did art professionally, so she had her own business. Uh, where, whereas her husband uh, was uh, 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 running uh, the church organ business. So we're very happy to include this painting uh, in our exhibit of treasures of the Westfield Athenaeum uh, because it uh, captures uh, uh, exactly what. Uh, uh, downtown West, uh, Westfield looked like in the mid-19th century. Now, another fascinating portrait. We've got um, just a couple of minutes left on the program, so we don't want, really want to show too many more. We'll save them yes. for January. So sure. um, it's right before Christmas week. So what's happening in Christmas week in the first couple of weeks in January at the Athenaeum? Yeah, well, we have, we have uh, various programs going on uh, uh, at the library, children's activities and this sort of thing. This exhibit that we've been talking about today and we're showing examples of uh, is, is going to be up until January 22nd. So if you want to see this show, uh, you've got about a month left to do it. So please, please come by and see it. I think everybody who has an interest in Westfield history or art uh, will find this show very interesting. Uh, so I, I look forward to seeing uh, everyone there because I think this just, this just gives you a few examples of what uh, this, this exhibit has to offer. There are many other uh, very important women artists who were active in Westfield, many in the early 20th century. We have examples of paintings by, by those artists. And there's just a whole array there. It's a real variety, I think. Uh, and so I think people will really enjoy this exhibit. 
Now, it, it, when we move into the new year, you have other exhibits planned coming down the road because we've talked about one that opens like in the middle of the winter. Yes, yes. After this exhibit comes down, uh, we have a show opening at the beginning of February by the artist Ruth Kerr. Ruth Kerr is a really interesting artist uh, who lives in East Hampton. Uh, but has done exhibits in Westfield before at the Westfield State University, uh, and she's also she's been in galleries all over the United States. Uh, uh, she does a lot of interesting art related to women's issues today. She uses a very interesting modern style uh, uh, to to reinterpret. Uh, 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 various themes related to women's issues and so it's a very provocative her paintings are very beautiful but provocative uh, really uh, they, they really make you think a lot about uh, some of the social issues we face today so I, I look forward to that exhibit uh, starting with me it, that'll, that exhibit will be up in February and March and I think people will really enjoy seeing that as well. And so the the library closes for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Correct. And then New Year's Day. Yes. But other than that, it's regular hours that, for the holidays. That's right. So if people are looking for something to do between uh, Christmas and New Year's, many times people are off during that, during that week. Come by the Athenaeum and see this exhibit. I think that you'll really enjoy it. And then when we come back in a couple of weeks, we're going to be announcing some interesting stuff going on. Yes. That's coming to Westfield. That should be pretty cool. Yes. So are you taking time off over the holidays? I think I'll take a few days, pro probably around Christmas time, uh, just to uh, get, my, get my holiday shopping done and spend a little time with the family and everything. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to do too much travel. Uh, uh, I think I'll stay around the area and just enjoy, uh, uh, a ho hopefully, a nice New England Christmas. Now, you had a little bit of time. You had a little time off over Thanksgiving and got out to the coast. Uh, was it? odd traveling in this new post-pandemic uh, period of time? Uh, very much so. It's the first time I've been on an airplane since uh, uh, prior to the uh, to the, the pandemic start, start. And I have to say, it, it was very, very strange, all the new procedures and everything that they're incorporating. Uh, but it was great to get out to some warm weather in California and see some uh, interesting, uh, uh, see an interesting opera, a couple of concerts, and go to some nice museums. It was a great trip. And probably some good restaurants restaurants too because oh yes oh yes uh, uh manhattan you know, you know great restaurant on manhattan beach uh, right right on the coast there uh you know the view of the ocean it was wonderful so when you're out traveling and, pe and people say well like what do you do and you say i i work at the westfield athenaeum in massachusetts do people outside of massachusetts have any idea what what westfield is or the athenaeum no, no, it's it's really amazing. In uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know when you when when I've when I've said you know I, I work in Westfield, uh, and they, they try to you know they they want to know where they 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 where that is. They you know uh, I say Western Massachusetts. They say, oh, is that close to Boston? I mean, that's the only thing they can relate to is is it close to Boston? Uh, so I, I think that's uh, you know, somehow Western Massachusetts has to do has to do a better job of marketing themselves so people know where we are. <laughs> But yeah. no, I mean, uh, when I travel, even, even if I go into New York now, I mean, you know, uh, people say, well, do you live in the Berkshires? No, uh, I live in Springfield. Uh, is that outside of Boston? Sort of. I mean, you know, yeah. people have no idea. Right, right, right. It, it, it's one of the strange things. I mean, uh, Western Mass, I mean, we have great colleges here. We have, you know, prominent people who've come out of Western Mass, but it seems like no one knows where it is. You know, the, everybody just relates to Boston or New York, yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I still think that uh, once somebody has come here, whether it's to the Berkshires or the Pioneer Valley, uh, it's a great place. Yes, yes. I, I, that's one of the things. I enjoy being out in California quite a bit. But I, one of the things I realize when I travel is there's some really nice things about being in Western Massachusetts. It's really a nice area in in many ways, and has a lot of cultural uh, cultural resources here. So, um, in spite of the fact that there's great museums and great places to visit, to, you know, in other places, I always like to come back to Western Mass and take advantage of what's here. I don't blame you. Now I know that. Um, you, you know, people are making their New Year's resolutions right now, and probably the most prominent resolution somebody around here should make is to make a visit to the Athenaeum. So how can they find out what's going on at the Athenaeum? Well, what I always recommend is go to our website. It's a West Ath. 
W-E-S-T-A-T-H dot org. Uh, and uh, uh, because we have a, you know, you can check out all the programs. Uh, uh, if you're interested in classes for your children or other kinds of programs, it's going to be on the, uh, on the Internet. And, I, uh, and, and uh, you know, we also have other services available. We have this, uh, we have this uh, thing called Wowbrary that you can sign up for, send you an email of uh, upcoming books that are coming out that the, that the Athenaeum has available for people to read. I, I, a lot of people love that service because there's just all these wonderful recommendations. So it's a great site to just check out once a week or so to see what's going on because there's always different kinds of programs, different kinds of activities uh, that we, we have listed there. So that wraps up another Athenaeum Spotlight with Guy McLean. Guy, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Merry always, Christmas to you. Always good to chill with you here and, and learn more about the Athenaeum. And in our next program, uh, we'll try to show some more of these incredible videos and hope people get out there. Uh, this wraps up another edition of Athenaeum Spotlight with Guy McLean. I'm Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles has been our chief engineer this morning. You've been listening to us on 89.5 FM WSKV or watching us on Westfield Community Programming Channel 15 or Southwick Community Programming Channel 15. If you want to go back and catch this program again or if you were listening on radio and want to see these videos that we were showing, you can find them archived on YouTube at WSKB Community Radio. Since it's the, the holiday season, I thought we'd end today's program with the overture to the opera version of the film, It's a Wonderful Life by Jake Heggie. So this is the prelude to It's a Wonderful Life. Season's greetings and thank you. <laughs>